Hello, and welcome to the Infinite Financial Freedom Podcast, where we empower you with financial literacy and guide you on your journey to financial freedom. I'm Josh Metal, and I'm here today with my new friend, Aaron Chapman. Aaron is a veteran in the finance industry with 25 years experience helping clients better understand, source, and finance cash flow positive investment properties. Aaron advises over 100 clients a month in the acquisition and financing of investment properties and primary residents. He ranks in the top 1% of all mortgage lenders in the entire country. He's a national speaker, a published author with several books and dozens of magazine articles. And he is someone who every time I talk to him inspires me to think and play bigger. So Aaron, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Well, thanks, Josh. I appreciate you letting me talk to your audience. Um, it's a it's a big deal to me when somebody trusts me with the ears of everybody that they built that that type of trust with. Well, you know, man, I've been in the investment property game for a long time. My first job actually was working on. I was twelve years old, and I spent the summer working on my grandfather's apartment building. And I learned real quick that um, you know managing and owning real estate property is a lot of work a lot of hard work, a lot of 12 hour days in the summertime when I was working as a kid landscaping. But I've had the great fortune of watching how real estate can literally transcend someone's economic uh, condition over a 30, uh, 30, I'd say 32 year uh, span now. And so when I meet somebody like you who, who has the ability to inspire and teach at the level that you do, um, I always want to. I always want to showcase uh, showcase your knowledge. So thanks for coming here. Let's kick in at the beginning, man. Tell us just a little bit about how you got started in finance, and how did you end up becoming an expert in residential real estate investments? So two vastly opposite. I mean, I would say they're opposite end questions, but man, there's stories behind them, right? And so you asked it, so you're going to get the story. Right. And I got to go all the way back to, to high school to be able to even kind of start where this all went, because I grew up on a cattle ranch in, in uh, central Utah. Uh, at least that's where my high school years were at. And those uh, few years that we were there, you learn a lot about business plans because there's no sm there's no simpler business plan in the world than, uh, than than what has to do with farming and ranching. Right. It's it's very, very simple on what 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 you're, you're doing. You have to apply certain principles to be successful. And if you if you shrink from work at all, you will be very unsuccessful. And the, the one main principle behind all of it is extremely hard work, like what you're talking about running, running real estate. Um, it's If a person's afraid of work or they think they're going to get involved in anything that's just going to make them money overnight, you might as well not step into it because it can be very, very disappointing. So that was where the start happened. From there, I went on to, oil, to the oil fields of Wyoming to, uh, to work in uh, at, for a welding company out there. From there, to Arizona, my family sold the uh, the the ranch partnership went sideways, and and you know, they sold out, moved on. My pop was a miner by trade. In fact, you got a, a picture of him back here. You see him uh, drilling back there uh, in a at a spot where I actually kind of shared that story with you when we started drilling into that area, and that's where I took over as as a miner myself, and right there where that that's pictured, and. Uh, so he went to the mines. I came back. I started running heavy equipment here in Arizona. I was driving truck. And it, there came to a point where the opportunity to go work with him came about. And I always wanted to see what it was like to work in the mines. So he was working in northern New Mexico. And that's the problem with a miner's life is you're always moving around to where the, where the work is. So he was working in a place called Cuesta, New Mexico, not far from the Colorado border. And um, when I went up there, we went underground the first day and it was something. Right. You're, you're several hundred feet underground. We were working uh, what they call the graveyard shift, which is overnight. And we're the only guys in the mine. This place was massive. And there's only five of us down there. Wow. Right. Shift boss and two and two and four miners. And I was considered a miners helper. So I was there to help my dad. And uh, when they put me in there, they're supposed to put me through all kinds of training. They said, just stay with your dad as the best we got. And so I went in there and he just started putting me to work and we worked our guts out. And I loved it. It was awesome. I mean, you get to go into this area, you're drilling six feet deep in the ground. You got, you know, 30 different holes you can drill into your packet full of explosives. You got to time those explosives right. You step around the corner, blow it up and go dig it out, support the ground and do it again. Very simple job. Well, after a period of time, they shut down that project. Unical was the one who ran, ran that mine. It just was not making the money they needed it to make. So they shut it down. And when they start shutting down, you have to keep a certain amount of people on to be able to get everything out and take care of all the little, little catch up stuff. 
uh, before they completely closed the mine in. And um, but I was one of the first guys to let go because I was one of the newest guys there. And it's not a matter of my ability to produce, not a matter of my ability to move rock. Um, my, my pop actually had a fit because I could move rock as, the same way he did. So we were moving rock together more though, so than anybody else in that entire mine. And yet they let me go anyway because of because of politics and hierarchy and what have you. I thought no big deal. I got a massive resume with all the stuff that I've done. There's no way I'm not going to get a job easy. I went and I went home with some money in my pocket, th thought things were going to be just fine. I get there. My wife ends up with a medical issue that needed immediate attention. And the insurance company wanted to play the game of pre-existing condition, you know, yeah. and that that later in, took a lawsuit to take care of, but didn't change the fact I had to pull from what savings I had to be able to take care of that. And it wiped it out completely. And I was still on the hunt for a job. And every place I went, the word that I would get back to describe why they would not hire me is because oh, I was overqualified. Never have I heard a word that just stung so bad in my life than the word <laughs> overqualified. And it got to the point where I was going to basically try and take a job as a $10 an hour truck driver, having hiring, hauling landscape rock. Right. And it just, to me, it was like the lowest end job I could possibly get for my skill sets, but I needed something just to put bread on the table. Cause we were yeah. to that extent. I went to this place and as I left for it, my wife gave me a coupon for diapers because we were out of diapers. So down to our last couple of them I had an infant son. Um, and so I took that coupon, went there, applied for that job. They gave me the same BS word of overqualified. And as I'm walking down the steps from that little trailer at that yard to, to head to my truck, I'm basically trying to wipe tears from my face. I'm 23 years old and I climb into my truck. I start it up. I say a quick prayer and I head out and I'm on my way to a grocery store and the gas light comes on in my truck. I would yet to check and I've yet to drive that truck very long to see how, how long I can go on a gas light, but I figured I better get gas right away. I found a grocery store. It had a gas station right outside on the corner, pulled up to that corner gas station, put the debit card in. I got a decline. I was overdrawn on my account. I had no other form of payment. So I rifled front through my truck. I found some coins and I started walking that, that grocery store parking lot. I found enough change and it felt like a couple hours to get a couple gallons of gas. And back then, you know, this is 1997, right? It wasn't that expensive for gas and people still use change, right? I mean, you, there, was, there was still prevalent for people to pay cash. So I was very, very lucky in that respect to have those two elements in my life available at that point. So I got that couple of gallons of gas, went into the grocery store to get those diapers. And as I'm walking out after checking out, a familiar face is walking in. So he, you know, of course, they, it was a kind of a quick little uh, reunion. He used to work at an, uh, he ran the office for a company I used to dig swimming pools for. He asked me how things were and I explained my current circumstances. And uh, he said, let's go to dinner tomorrow or the next day, whatever it was. Um, I said, dude, I can't afford dinner. He goes, no, I'll take you. I have a gift certificate from a client. Um, so figured, why not? So he took me and my wife to Red Lobster in Mesa, Arizona. And we went and sat down and we, we had dinner and he told me about the mortgage industry. Now, the only thing I knew about the mortgage industry at that time was when you watch TV back then, there was the, the, the old man, the old lady losing the farm to this thing called a mortgage. And to me, is a very, very negative word. I didn't like that word, but it was something. So I went in, um, took that card, called the guy, as he, he said. And the guy said, yeah, Keith said that you were going to be calling. He says, why don't you come in? And let's, let's, uh, let's talk. So I cut a foot off of my hair. I shaved. My mom <laughs> bought me some clean clothes, some, some business-like clothes. Um, and then from there, I went into, um, into uh, his office and interviewed. And they started me as a telemarketer that weekend. I came back in, still in the business clothes, and the gal you know, opened the door for me that was going to train me. And she was in a tank top and shorts, like, listen, this is not that kind of place. You don't need to dress up like that. Um, and then from there, I started, you know, trying to hack leads from their from the, their, their list uh, that they got from title companies. And once I pulled some leads uh, in, I convinced them to let me work them as an LO. So they started me off uh, training with the, with somebody as an LO, just how to do it. And it was, it was, it's half fast the training you could possibly get to figure this out. Um, and then I did find a job driving truck to Sacramento. So I go to Sacramento back once a week, then Vegas back once a week. And then I would do two, three days in the office. And that was miserable. Absolutely miserable. I, I'm, I'm grateful to the guy giving me the opportunity, but I couldn't wait to get out of that job. Yeah. From there, um, after that three months of doing that, I went back to one of the companies I dug swimming pools for. They put me on as an operator again, running heavy equipment. I get up at 3.30 in the morning every day. 
I'd be the, the yard by four, be the job site, hopefully by 4, 35 o'clock and then work till noon, go home, change, get to the office, work from two till 10 p.m., sleeping about four hours a night for about a year. And then in 1998, the interest rates dropped a bit. Um, I think it was 98 or 99, I think it was 98. And we went below 7% for an owner occupied. And I was able to Remember get that. eight new transactions over a weekend, man. And I've been, I'm, I'm a very, very, I'm, I'm a man of faith. And I spent a lot of time on my knees praying about this. When do I, when can I quit doing two jobs? And finally it came. It felt like I felt very confident and comfortable. We didn't have that, that uneasy feeling. And so I went full, full time into it and it's not been easy. It's been a battle uh, doing that. But um, over a period of time from 1999, when I started full-time into that to about 2001 is when I first got, I think it's 2002. I picked up my first investment property or 2003, somewhere in there. And that's where I started to understand the real estate investor and why real estate made sense. Um, and then I started getting real estate investors coming into Arizona and buying in that 2003 to 2005. And it's a way different conversation. The conversation you're having with a real estate investor versus a first time home buyer, or anybody buying a house is so extremely different that I could, I could identify that person better. It was all based upon the numbers, based upon the, the return and, and, right. and what they were going to gain from owning real estate and not just, Hey, what's the, you know, it's got the perfect kitchen with the perfect master closet and it's on the perfect street and it's right by the yoga studio. My life will be perfect when I close. Right. But then you, you jerk wad loan originator, keep asking me for pro for questions or asking me for paperwork, slowing down my process. And my life is not perfect now because of you. <laughs> right. So that's that. And most of the time they didn't even qualify for the damn loan anyway. Right. So that we have the crash of 2008 and that 2008 crash. My business was still existing, right, coming into uh, August of 2008, but I was still having to do a little bit of supplementing here and there. And I was working with some guys who asked me to come do some fabrication work with them. We took a, a Bristol, English Bristol bus, double-decker bus, and we converted it to a mobile strip club, if you will. I mean, it's basically what we did. Um, and we were working day and night. I was back to sleeping four hours a night. Then August 8th came around. And August, and eight is my lucky number. So this is 8, 8 of 08 jumped on a Harley. I'm like, I'm going to spend three days. This was a Friday. I'm going to get my mind clear and really get focused on where I'm supposed to go. 15 minutes into that ride, another driver flipped on his brinkler and came into me and put me into another car and me, sent me flipping about 80 plus miles an hour. Oh my God. I woke up that night in the hospital um, after surgery, multiple fractures, I think 17 fractures, collapsed lung. Um, if you if people have been to Arizona in August, and thought what felt what the temperature is like in the air, I can guarantee that the pavement's a lot worse. And I got to lay there for a lengthy period of time that uh, while, because the traffic was so bad and trying to get a, and I was right at an exit, so I had to go way up the other direction to get an ambulance down to me. And I, it baked me pretty good, but it was a hell of a lesson to learn in life. So when you go from going into that in, event, that happening, my business was still intact. I was worth on paper a little over $3 million. And I was 190 pounds, 7% body fat. I was very athletic. I was out doing a lot of things, rock climbing, uh, marathons, things like that, mountain biking. I got wheeled out of there in a wheelchair a few weeks later. Um, my Everything crashed. My net worth went from three plus million to negative 1.5 million because of my liabilities. And my uh, I went from 190%, 190 pounds at 7% body fat to 156 pounds. Um, and so I had to learn everything again, how to walk again, um, I had to, you know, get, a, I had a, my business was obliterated and I had a memory that lasted three minutes. So there's coming back from that, right? So it's, it's been a very, very interesting endeavor up to that point. And it, it, of course, there's more things since then, you know, more, more problems that happen in the market, more things that have occurred that make you start over. But that's, that's really where I started getting more into the real estate investor. Cause when I got my business back and I got my mind trained back and it was trained back by. Sure. I didn't have anybody help me with that other than my mom, who's a realtor here in Arizona, Marianne Chapman. She's got a really, really awesome real estate business. And she's one of the consummate professionals. And this other gal here with Caldwell Banker, her name was Carolyn Irby. And they were the only ones that stuck with me when that happened. And they would call me up, give me a lead. And then five minutes later, call me back and say, hey, did you write that down? I'm like, what, what down? They said, get your pad, get your paper and write this down. And I carried a pad and paper with me for quite a while until I was able to get the memory, get my memory to work. Um, and that's how I ran my business. And then I stumbled into some investors coming into buying into Arizona. 
And that's when I had that opportunity, that blessing of working with a the local company that was selling real estate and, and, and rehabbing real estate and a guy who was net, uh, networking across the country and bringing investors into Arizona. And I was blessed to be that guy in Arizona for them. Um, but it's by the grace of God did that happen. And then from and, and then people just knowing people, right, people that recommend you and just it was it's so many little tiny things that culminated to make that happen. And then they went from there to Indiana and then to Texas. And then so I just followed them around as they continued to go. And the conversation that I'd have with these people was more of a friendship than a business relationship. Um, and then it, it went into where I'm so interested in the success that they have more so than the success that I have, because I was working on 50 and 60 and $70,000 deals. That's not a successful business model for a loan originator. When you've got to do 20 plus transactions just to get the same income that a guy's doing three transactions, right? Um, so I caught a lot of hell from the companies I worked with that I was doing these little tiny loans. But that's what started to pay off is sticking with that for years, right? From 2009 all the way to where I am right now. And now we're doing, I'm doing 1300, I did 1378 transactions last year for real estate investors. My average, my average is still about 120, 130,000, but that's still a pretty dang good payday, if you will, if you want to call, I mean, if that's what you're after is the, the income, but in reality, it's the relationships I've got all over the world. And it's not in the national business. I deal with people all over the world. Well, man, thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think a lot of times people see success and they think that it's an, it's a, it, it was an overnight event. And rarely do they understand the, the depth, if you will, or the struggles, if you will, uh, that people go through on their journey. And, and similarly to you, you know, um, I had a, my screen's going a little wonky here. Sorry, let me get it centered back up. I had a, you know, a situation early in my life where there was a lot of financial struggle before there was financial success. And I'm sure there's somebody out here that, who just listened to your story, Aaron, and they're thinking to themselves, man, you know, I, I my, my challenges don't look so bad now, now having heard all that Aaron went through. And so I hope people will take a little bit of inspiration. You know, Aaron has properties, I think you told me in six or seven different states, Aaron? Six, six states. Six states, a massive real estate investor, huge amount of success, but not without, you know, a couple of knockout, drag out fights in his life that he had to, he had to pull himself through. So, so yeah, thanks and, for sharing and those knockout, drag out fights. It's, it's not even just the market and the trying to build your business. I mean, sometimes it's the people that are there working with you, right? I mean, it's the people are supposed to support you and they have an idea of what they're supposed to be doing and what you're supposed to be doing. But sometimes your idea doesn't mesh with their idea. And you have to decide whether or not you are going to stay with the path that you're on or you're going to fall pray to what they want you to do because they feel better about that. I fought with a lot of people. I mean, I went to almost to blows with regional managers over their, what their design for my business was. I had a guy merge with me into, or he, he invited me to merge with him in 2015. And then that was, was it March, of, April of 2015 by, by November 1st of 2015, he had taken everything, the databases, everything. I was starting over at zero in, 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 um, November 1st, 2015. All I could do is sit down with my team and I had only three members of my team and I, I had learned how to build a big business because I watched how he had done it when he brought me in there because his was, I mean, I was closing maybe 18 to 20 transactions a month at that time when we merged and then we we're doing 40 and 50, right? I'm like, we can go to hundred and we were working on this and working on this, but he saw the opportunity to just take it all. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, to me, it was the worst thing that could have happened to me at the time, but the greatest thing that ever happened to me to help me do what I've done, because then it, it forced me to ask some questions, you know, had one of the regional managers trying to tell me I need to fire my people and start over. I'm like, no, 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 give me 90 days. So I sat down with my people and said, guys, that phone is going to ring in a few minutes and somebody's going to want us to quote them on an investment property. What are we going to do from there? And we built out the plan. Kind of like going to Chipotle to get a burrito, right? You have a person comes in, you have a different person at different stages doing different things to ensure that you're accurate in burrito construction. Well, if you've ever stood in line at Chipotle and really understood how many people they had there, there's 11 staff members at a fully staffed Chipotle. I figured if you need 11 people for burrito construction, how many do I need for an intricate financial instrument like, the, like what we have now with doing investment loans? Because they're so heavily regulated. Yeah, well, that's where I built a method of 11 people there. And that was all started from him pulling that crap on me in November of 2015. Now look where we sit. 
Love it, man. Well, congratulations. And again, thanks on uh, congratulations on your success and, and thank you for, for the, for the valuable share. Let's, let's get into, you know, you mentioned, uh, I think you told me that you have a, a, a family based business where your, your four children and your wife all kind of are involved in the, um, in the business and making decisions. So talk to us just a little bit about that. I find that very interesting. So are you familiar with the infinite banking strategy? I am not. Okay. So I have a client of mine who was, uh, I mean, really, really cool guy. He was the, at the time worked at the Pentagon and he was, uh, worked directly for the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. Uh, he oversaw all the weapons for the military. Prior to that, he was an instructor at the Naval Academy. Prior to that, he was the captain of the USS Tucson nuclear sub. Wow. Then I think, believe he is the XO of the USS Kingfish, I think, uh, prior to that. So this guy's got some really cool freaking background, right? Seriously. So to, so to me, it was awesome, right? I had a sub captain who's on his way to become an admiral. It's a client and a friend. Well, then, um, then I heard, you know, there, there's this, when I was working on another loan for him, he was no longer with in the military that he had moved on to sell life insurance. So I... I take a very, very personal role in all my clients' businesses. And what I do is I say, you know, you're the CEO of your real estate investment business. I'm your trusted advisor from the prevent from the financial perspective. And if there's something that I see that's obviously wrong, I'm going to call it out. And so what I did is I called him up and said, hey, Gary, I got a question for you. He goes, what's that? And I said, um, I heard this happened. And I described all that to him. He goes, yeah, that's true. And I said, are you effing stupid? Right. And I don't know if you got a family podcast going on here or not. So I don't want to go straight up into what I said. And he just chuckles. He says, I will not answer that question until you get your wife on a video conference call with us. I'm like, done. So October of 2016, we're in a cabin for my, it was my birthday weekend uh, with my family. And we did this go-to meeting with him. Now it's pre-Zoom, pre so we had to do it that way. And um, he told me all about this and shared everything about utilizing life insurance for how basically building your wealth and you being able to use that, those funds to... Um, purchase real estate and invest in other things. I'm like, my wife, I asked my wife what she thought. She says, I don't get any of it, but I trust him. And that was huge for me. Absolutely massive. Cause my wife would prefer to shank you rather than find a way to trust you. It's much <laughs> easier just to put blood on the floor. Right. Well, for her to say that was massive for me. I'm like, I really like this. I think we should do it. Well, at that point I'd had $90,000 set aside. I was going to buy some investment property with. So what I did is I took that 90,000 and I purchased a life insurance policy on me that had a death benefit. I believe about 2.7, $2.8 million. Well, then uh, within the first, I think 30 days, if I remember correctly, I had access to $83,000 of those funds via a life insurance loan, just like a 401k loan. But the, the difference between a 401k loan, it's a very structured loan, right? You borrow it, they put you on a structured payback period, and you cannot borrow another damn thing until you've paid it all back. Well, this, this one you can borrow. I borrowed uh, 83,000, bought those three real estate properties with, they were my down payment, right? And I took the cash flows from those properties, plus 10% of my income, which is what I used to build that 90 grand anyway, and start paying back that loan on that. And then I knocked it down from 83,000 to a $53,000 loan in about 16 months. I think it was 16, 17 months. Don't quote me on exact here. Then I was able to buy another property, right? Cause there was, it knocked down from 80 to 53, which is $30,000 of my loan paid off. I was able to pull that back out. Now, the way that loan's designed, whether I put it, pay down a thousand bucks or a hundred bucks, I can take it back out anytime I want. Right. So that loan has a, has a interest rate associated with it, but the money sitting in the life insurance has an interest rate associated with it too. So it literally kind of zeroes itself out. So people are like, well, why would you borrow against yourself? I mean, it's like you're, it's like you're getting zero when you do that. It's like, well, it's actually, I'm getting, I'm still gaining ground because I'm paying it back so quickly. But when you take money out of your bank account, are you making anything off of it? No, no. Right. You've got to put it in the investment to make the money. Right. Well, I have it now in this life insurance policy. It's making about a one, one and a half percent, even though I've taken out because of the way I pay it back. So I created an engine. So then when I pay it down uh, to that, that 50,000 or 53,000, I pulled it out, bought another one. Now my cash flow is higher. My income is higher because I'm talking to people about this and I've got more investors and, I'm, and it continues to grow. So I pay it down faster and faster. Now I could buy a property every two to three months if I want by the way that that generates uh, the cash flows and everything else to keep paying these things down. Now, since then I've done a life insurance policy of the exact same type on each one of my family members, plus another one on myself for a total of seven of them. 
And when we get ready to do investments together, we see how much money we have available, which right now it's very substantial. And um, we look at the, the investment itself. My family will vote on it. We get together and we will talk to the person offering the investment opportunity. We'll do a Zoom call with them so my entire, all my kids can ask questions and they can vote on what, what they want to do with that. Now, it's my money. I got 100% autonomy to do whatever the hell I want with it. The reason I give them voting capabilities so they can evaluate for themselves with everything that we own, because eventually this trust that I'm building, they will be in charge of it. They need to know why it exists and why we, why we invested in that and what we're getting from it. Then uh, they also are required when they get married to purchase the same type of life insurance policy, them and their spouse, and figure out what 10% of their income is and build the policy in a way that they can put 10% of their income every year and build that up. And when they build that up over the next 20 years, they should be in some pretty good shape with that and be able to participate in the trust in the next 10 to 15 years, I'm guessing, maybe a little bit less. But that gives them the ability to participate in our investments so they can build their wealth to their family. So there are two reasons. One, they got to understand it. They got to be able to build the same way that we're building, add some safety there. If something happens, let's say if something happens to my daughter's husband, she doesn't come back to me. She's got a death benefit to take care of her. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to help her out, right? It doesn't mean we don't have the resources to help her uh, weather that storm, but it gives them a huge, huge, huge foundation to start their family. And I'm, I require if anybody's going to be a beneficiary of this trust, they have to do exactly the same going on forever. If they don't do that, they do not get to participate in the trust. Now, they'll still be in any sort of will that I have to have, you know, my cars or my, you know, all my toys, but they don't get the, 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 any assets from the trust. And if they do that, I think that that should hopefully perpetuate into something huge for my family. What a what an incredible case study there, Aaron. I love how you've done that. I got a couple of questions. What, what is the type of life insurance vehicle that you're talking about? It's just a whole life policy. Okay. You know, and, so it, it, and it, the cool thing about it is, is, you know, if I took all the money on my bank account to buy all these assets, sure, my family would have the assets. I take it all of the life insurance to buy the, the assets. My family has the assets. Now they have $11, $11 million in death benefit, mm -hmm. right? So nothing you can get from any other instrument, in my opinion, I haven't checked them all out, but it's the holy grail as, I, as far as I can tell. Fantastic. Yeah, we had a, a podcast guest on last week, actually, his name was Jerry Feta. And he talked about a specific type of life insurance policy that has a higher rate of um, lendability, meaning you can borrow against that asset at a higher loan to value. And I, I think it might be the same vehicle that you're in, because you said you borrowed something like 80 or 90% of the amount of cash value inside the life insurance within the first month. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll find the name of that and I'll, I'll send it your way to make sure that's what you're in. And, and there may be one that you, you, know, you want to research as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jerry. more than happy to even just connect you with the guy who connected me up. He's, I'll just be blunt. He's like the shittiest insurance salesman in the world, but the greatest educator on the subject. The guy you want to talk to because he's not going to sell you on anything. He doesn't care. Get it if you want, but he does it because he loves it and he thinks this changes people's lives and it does. Love it. You think he'd be a good podcast guest? He'd be an awesome podcast guest. Great, man. Thank you. I mean, you come for on, think about it, guys. That was a, you get to say you had a nuclear sub captain on your podcast. It's kind of cool. <laughs> I love it. I'd love to have him. Thank you. The other thing that I love about your story is you're building a legacy, right? And I, 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 I know that's important to you. Um, when you talk about inheritance, most, think, most people think about inheritance as a monetary transfer. We die, our kids get to take over the, the monetary gain. But I think of an inheritance more of a transfer of knowledge or a, or a transfer of wisdom. So you're creating in what you're doing, this family connection, you're leaving something behind for the next generation. You'll have something to talk about and something to be connected and to, to work in, in, in tandem with your family for the rest of your life. And then meanwhile, you're transferring your knowledge from generation to generation, which I believe is what a real inheritance is. And that's that's 100% why I did design it the way it was, because when I, you look up the word legacy, the first definition has to do with a monetary base, right? Transferring the mon monetary uh, wealth, which I highly disagree with, right? The next generation, we've seen that. You know, get, at best case scenario, you get the third generation is the one who wipes it all out with, with their frivolous acts. So for me, it was transferring of the information that helped build it so they would continue to compound it. Right. I'm the first one. I, I don't know if I'm the first millionaire in my family. I can't say that for certain, but I know I don't know any other ones in my family that are. 
right? And I don't know anybody. It's I've never met somebody in with with my same last name from my direct line, right? That that can claim that. But the other thing that I like to convey to my kids and to everybody else who might be listening, you, if even if you're not a millionaire now, there comes a point where you have a million dollars or your access to a million, or you're a millionaire. I could put my hands on a million bucks right now, no problem, right? And what it feels like, guys, it feels like Tuesday. It, it, it's no big change. There's no, the, there's no confetti doesn't fall from the sky. Life does not change. You are still you. So don't put so much on becoming that that becomes such an obsession because you're going to find out that life is no different and your obsession did nothing but drive you crazy. I totally agree. Man, that reminds me of um, Elon Musk had a, you know, a, a tweet the day that he became the richest man in the world. And, and his tweet was something like, um, how odd back to work. Yeah. <laughs> like, all right, great. Now, now I still got to go produce something. All right. Hey, listen, I want to get into, we've got about 15 minutes left, maybe 20 minutes left. I want to get into two things that I find really, really interesting. So number one, help us understand as a real estate investor, let's go through the various ways that real estate investors get paid. And then I want to transition to inflation after yesterday's CPI reading, 7.5% uh, inflation. Rents, by the way, in my neck of the woods are up 20% year over year. Uh, and, and let's talk a little bit about inflation-induced debt destruction, which confuses the heck out of people. And maybe we can weave those in because I think you're going to tell us that that might be one of the ways that real estate investors get paid. 100%. So ask away, first question, and I'll see what I can do with that. All right. So let's talk about the ways, the different ways that real estate investors get paid. How do I get paid? How do you get paid as a real estate investor? So a lot of people love to quote Kiyosaki and, and this whole thing of that you make money on the buy. So they get really, really wrapped up in trying to find something undervalued uh, as far as the sales price is concerned. And you're not going to find it right now. There's too damn many people out there looking for that. The benefit to that, though, is they're going to look past a lot of your a lot of your deals that are great deals because they're like, well, there's not enough, there's not enough equity in it. There's not enough, I'm not, I'm not getting a deal on this. You're not gonna deal get a deal on it, guys. But your ability to finance this thing for 30 years is a is where the big deal comes from. So that's when you're making money on the buy. So Josh, we're gonna do some math together. So you might, might want to get your calculator out because I'm gonna Ready. I'm gonna call on you to do this. I know all the answers to the question, but I'm gonna have you do this. And we're gonna go very, very, very generic. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with 100 and we're going with these numbers may not be achievable, guys. Don't say that I'm talking about a specific market. We're just doing this for the sake of the math because I don't know how good Josh is. Um, so I don't want to embarrass him on his podcast. No pressure. So no we're going pressure. to say $100,000 acquisition. We're going to say 20% down. And we're going to say a 1% rent to value ratio. Well, I'm not sure if you know that term, but we'll hit it. A uh, 30 year fixed mortgage with $200 a month in cash flow. All right. So, got all that down? I have no idea how to punch that into a calculator. No, that's just, that's just, that's just the baselines. All right. I got it. I got now I'm going to ask crazy. questions. Okay. So, <laughs> we have a $100,000 acquisition price, right? Yep. 20% down. Yep. How much was the down payment? 20000 20000 So, that means you're financing how much? 80,000. 80,000. So I'm just priming the pump right now. So I'm just trying to grease the gears and make sure that everything's working. So $80,000 loan. So I tell, when I'm talking to a real estate investor, I, I want them to change their mindset from a consumer spending money and going into debt to now they are the CEO of their real estate investment firm. And they have two jobs. That's it. First job is to find the right people to work with on the real estate side that's going to help them source, acquire, rehab, build, or, and manage, maintain their business. That's it. That, you got to find the right people. If you don't have the right people, I don't care what the asset is, it will never work. 100%. Then, and the other people you got to find is the right people to work with on the lending side, right? And they're on the insurance side, and on the property, all these, all these people, right? If you're, if you're a CEO and you, and you went for the cheapest if you decided to send out um, a request for you're trying to hire people to, to be in your company and you want board members and you want staff, you want executives, and all you did was look for the cheapest people you can get, who'd take the least amount of money, what kind of company do you have? Completely disintegrated, right? You got to look at their capabilities and, and see how that first before you start talking any kind of money. 
Then the next thing you got to do is pick the right business to buy. You don't just go out there and buy a house because it exists. It's got to be in a place that you can keep reasonably rented for the entire time you own it and that you can raise rents on. If you can't do that and you don't believe you can do it, you don't buy the asset at all. That's a business that you walk away from. So let's say you did your job correctly as the CEO of your business. With, and, and you've got that, pro, that, that asset that you can keep reasonably rented for the entire time you own it. Who pays that 80% back? The tenant. The tenant. The okay. So how much was that 80% again? 80,000. 80,000. Now let's take 80,000, divide that by 30, because that's how many years it's going to take them to pay that off. And tell me what number you get. 80,000 divided by 30. Yep. That gives us 2,666. Point six 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 six, right? Yes, sir. So $2,666.67, basically. Now divide that number into what was your initial investment into the asset? 20,000. Okay, divide that into 20,000. Tell me what percentage you get. 1.33. It's actually 13.33. Well, 13.33%. So, yeah, it's because uh, you know decimal points, right? Yep. So what that tells you guys is averaged over 30 years is your 20,000 will now grow by 13.33% of the original 20,000 every single year you have somebody in that paying that asset for you. Right. So we know your 20,000 already grows by 13.33%. Where else are you going to find a calculated and a structured return anywhere, especially like that. So we know that how that works. Right. So set that aside. That goes on the shelf. That's your baseline revenue. So we said it gets a 1% rent to value ratio. Are you familiar with that term, Josh? Yeah, that would be your um, your purchase price is 1% of the annual gross rent. That would be- uh, Vice your, versa. The annual gross rent is 1% of the purchase price. So actually, your monthly gross rent is 1% of the purchase gross rent. price. Okay. So what would that be then? Uh, the monthly, okay, so we'd have 100,000. And 1% would be a, a thousand bucks. Thousand bucks, right? Very, very yep. simple. I know I, a lot of people get stuffed on it. It's like, oh man, I got to do the calculator on that one. So thousand dollars a month. Very, very simple. Yep. And we said you'll make $200 a month cash flow off that thousand dollars a month, right? Yep. So that's year one. Now we live in an inflationary environment, do we not? We sure do. What would you say is the rate of inflation today according to the CPI? I'd say it's 7.5%. 7.5%. Do you believe that? Well, being that the uh, CPI index says that rent was up 3.8% and how the facts from the Utah Apartment Association tells me that rents were up 20% and other national indicators say 18 to 20%, I would say there's no way in the world that that's accurate. 100%. If you get into like just food costs, right? The meat index is going up over 20%. Yep. Right? Fuel costs, right? Yep. Thanks to Brandon. And you start getting into all these things, you start figuring out where we're sitting. Dude, we're, we're, we're approaching 16% inflation year over year. Yeah. So 7% is a complete jerk off uh, number they're giving us. But that tells you something that the Fed's willing to admit to seven and a half. That's massive. It's the highest we've seen since 1982. So as we just talked about, we get to raise rents to face inflation. Now you're saying you're, you're, you're seeing some enormous inflation. So let's just use 3%. Because I'm a pretty benevolent uh, type of landlord. I'm not one that punches my people at 20 and 30% like I'm seeing. My poor niece, she pays 1200 bucks a month for a two-bedroom, one-bath apartment. They're raising it 300 bucks next year in oh, two months. That's freaking insane, brutal, right? Brutal, man. And, and they don't have the money to pay this. To me, that is, that's thievery in my opinion. That, that is us taking advantage of people, but this is, might not be the place for that soapbox. I just use 3% when I'm, when I'm running my numbers on my houses. So- if we raise the rent 3% on that $1,000 a month, how much are you raising it by? That'd be three, uh, $30 a month. 30 bucks, right? You're not getting excited over 30 bucks and your tenant won't get excited over 30 bucks, right? 30 bucks, they're like, okay, cool. 30 bucks a month goes up. So what did that do to your cash flow, right? Now we're going just base numbers. We're not looking at increasing in taxes and whatever, because we know it's going to go up. We know taxes will go up. We know insurance go up. We also know rents will go up. So let's just, let's just use baseline numbers. So you were getting 30, you're getting $200 a month cash flow year one. Now you raised rents by 30 bucks. What are you getting in cash flow now? 560 bucks. Right? Per month. Oh, per month. Excuse me. So two, 230. 230, right? Nothing, yeah. nothing overly sexy, right? Yes. Divide 30 into 200 and tell me what percentage you get. 
15%. That's a 15% compound growth in your cash flow every time you raise the rent 3%. 3% gives you a 15% compound growth. Did it just become a little bit sexier? It became a lot sexier. Huge, right? People fail to see where these, where these things are. I'm trying to illuminate this stuff. Now, here's where it really gets awesome. Does the lender get to raise the payment on the loan to pace inflation? They do not. They do not. They have to accept on this $100,000 transaction, $405 a month, uh, every month for the next 30 years, right? Spot on. Right. So um, so with that, in fact, I'm going to change this. I'm actually going to change this to a different number just for the sake of doing it. And I need to plug in our inflation numbers. here. I'm just going to use an 8% inflation. I'm going to be a little bit benevolent here. Because uh, we know it's higher than the 7.5. So, and plus, we also know that they're going to try and get the flights to go down. So, if Fleet's able to get the, the inflation back down into the twos, according to their BS metric, we will know at that point inter inflation is still going to be over 8%, always, right? So, I'm going to use 8% for our, for our numbers. So, let's say you did um, $479 a month because interest rates are going up anyway. Let's just say it's $479 a month for that uh, $80,000 loan. So that it will be um, 80,000 principal being paid back over 30 years, $92,670.55 in interest paid over 30 years by your tenant for a total of $172,670.55. That's what you're paying back, more than double what you borrowed. Most people then are freaking out. So what if I put an extra $100 a month on this? How can I, can I take all my cash flows and of all my houses and do the debt snowball? Like pay off one and then have the cash flow increase and pay off another. I'm here to tell you, quit that. Stop thinking that way, right? Pay that number they're telling you to pay because every time you make a payment on the loan, the lender's receiving less money because the dollar's worth less. At 7.5%, that's about 6.2 or 6.3%. It's, I mean, 0.62% it's losing every single month in value, right? Mm, so it's losing five eighths of a percent in its value every single month that it stays at that 7.5 and we know it's gonna to continue to go up. So as you're raising rents, you're getting a 15% compound growth, the, the lender's getting a 7.5% compound decline That's in right. what they receive from you because the dollar's losing its a buying power. So when you recalculate every dollar from the day you closed on that loan till the day you pay it off, you may have paid $172,670.55 in actual dollars but the cumulative value of all those dollars over 30 years is $65, excuse me, $65,367.07. You never even pay back what you borrowed. So you leverage high, you leverage long, you pay off slow, and you convince somebody else to do it for you and write that off on your taxes. So that's where that inflation-induced debt destruction question comes from, right? People to understand that inflation is destroying the debt. You may be paying them back a large amount, but in, you're not giving it back to them in a, in a, with an instrument of value to them. But yet you can continue to increase your income while doing that back to the lender. This is so hard for people to understand on a month by month basis because, you know, rents going up $30 a month doesn't make anybody rich. But what Aaron's trying to say is, over a period of 30 years, rents going up $30 every year makes you fabulously well off. And the, the best illustration I have of this, maybe you have one too, Aaron. Um, you know, I bought an apartment building, the first apartment building I bought with my mother, 20, we're, we're going into our 21st year. We still own that building. When I bought the building, the rents were $240 to $275 a month. And we paid $315,000 for that property. Fast forward 20 years later, the rents are $1,495. Now each, for each of the, each of the units. Wow. Now I've done a lot of remodel and we've put money back into the property. And yes, there's been some investments, but when you look at that, you know, when, when I was getting $250 a month for that building, so I'm getting something like, I, I think they were around there. I think I was getting somewhere in the neighborhood of about 45,000 a year in gross rental income for a $315,000 building, which is a fantastic buy. But now the gross rental income on that building is like $140,000 a year. So when you look at the gross rents compared to what that purchase price was 20 years ago, the rents go up 
and makes the significance of the debt insignificant because of the amount of increased rents and cash flow. And that is what happens when the dollar is devaluated. The value of the dollar that you borrowed is less every month. And it's hard to see month by month. But looking back over 20 years, that's how people get wealthy in real estate. 100%. And what I, I, in talking with a lot of people, especially with rates going up right now, they're having a very hard time justifying purchasing a property because the cash flow is going to be so low according to the pro forma they're staring at. But I explained to them, said, guys, look at it from a perspective of, you know, find out in that area what are rents going up by, right? Is it three? Is it five? Is it six? Is it eight? So a lot of the places I'm buying is averaging about 8% increase per year. Then look at the first two to three years does when you raise those rents. See how that influences your expense versus your cash flow and then make your decision. Don't make your decision based on the performer for year one. Base it off of what year two and year three, because you may have went looking for houses when interest rates were a point lower than they are today. You finally find one again, the contract one with the interest rates are higher. And you're like, oh, crap, I'm not going to buy this now because I'm not going to cash flow as much. Look two to three years down the road. It mitigates all that difference. That's the benefit of what's happening out there in the market. You're locking in your cost while that you can continue to increase your revenue, right? As long as people get, get their head wrapped around that. And I know it, like you said, it's hard, to, hard to, to wrap your head around. So what I did to help my clients is I had an app created with a calculator to be able to do that. So anybody can go to their app store, whether it's Android or whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, iPhone, search for the QJO investment tool, as in the quit jerking off investment tool. And the reason I called it that, because that's all you're doing when you're so worried about what the rates are doing or what the market's doing, all these things, stick with your job, getting the right people and the right asset to, to stay reasonably rented that you can raise rents on. You do that and mitigates everything. And the calculator has all that information. You can go to my website and see how to use that calculator. And so you can see for yourself what inflation is doing on your specific deal. I love that. Um, and we'll, we're going to put in the show notes uh, and in the Facebook Live that we're doing right now, we'll put the link to your app and, and the link to your, your resources on, on your website. We also found your books on Amazon and we will put links to, to, to the books. So Aaron, um, in, in the you. time we have left, brother, uh, let's, let's, let me ask you one, one last question. You know, I talk to a lot of people in high cost of living areas, California, We'll just leave it at that, California. And, and they really are having a hard time wrapping their, their brain around the cost of real estate. I, I mean, the cost of real estate in Arizona is up in, in incredibly high. And so how do you counsel people or help people land on the right place to invest their hard-earned money into real estate? So uh, the majority of my clients actually live in California, interestingly enough. Um, and there's... It, it, I, it's crazy how I do 1,300 transactions. I hardly do any business with anybody in Arizona. It's really weird to even see an Arizona uh, number came up, uh, Arizona number come up on my phone. So, but what is, I work with a lot of people building houses or rehabbing houses across the country. I'm licensed in 28 states. And so it's building relationships with those people in those, those parts of the country, connecting them with my clients. And many of the times it's them connecting with their clients. That's like 90% of the exchange. They'll send me 90% of the stuff that they, or 90% of my business for them sending me referrals. 10% is somebody just calling me off of seeing me pop up somewhere like on bigger pockets or a podcast. And then I hand those 10% off to people who are doing a very good job. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of dirt bags out there that I've dealt with. And there's some guys that I just, I cannot stand um, people working with them because they're not in it for the buyer. They're not in it for the investor. They're definitely not in it for the tenant. They're in it for themselves. And it's evident. You know, it's evident how they act. It's evident how they are. They, they There's some people out there that they will, they will video and post on YouTube an eviction. I mean, that's oh, that, that to me is just so dirtbag. I cannot believe that somebody would do that. And they are proud of being what they would call themselves a slumlord. They're going to push things around. I can't get behind that at all. Amen. You know, we need to be seeing that the investor is very successful and you're doing it to ensure that they are successful what they do. And you will get plenty of business, right? I, hell, I, I look at kind of like the gold rush, of the 1800s, right? Who made the most money during the gold rush? It was those that were selling the, the picks and the shovels, if I picks remember correctly. Picks and shovel salesmen, 100%. The outfitters, right? That's what we are. We're pick and shovel salesmen, right? Both us on the real estate side, on the lending side, and you're doing the same thing. So, But the difference between us and those guys is we are very, very concerned where they sink that pick or shovel into the ground. Because if they do it in a place where they just find dirt, eventually that becomes gardening tools. Yep. Nobody makes no money off of gardening tools, right? Because those things don't get wore out. But if they find 
that massive vein of gold and they keep digging, they're going to need more picks, more shovels, personnel, trucks, equipment, and God willing, a train to haul it all. Because who do they come to for, to get that stuff? They come to me. I become enormously wealthy because they became enormously wealthy. If I did not ensure that, then they do, then they don't get there and I don't get there. And when my, my clients start to fail, I know I will start to fail and I violently oppose failure. I cannot have that happen. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I took, put all the energy and time I put into it. And that's why I've hired the staff that I have. It's an extremely expensive endeavor, but it's 100% worth it when you see somebody call you up with tears in their eyes and they're saying, I never thought it possible for me to accomplish this and you made it happen. Yeah, man, you, you told me a, a story and I don't want to use any names or anything, but you told me a story of a client that I think recently called you and, and said, I, I, I could never have thought of creating this much income. I think it was a teacher salary or something um, like she that. Was a, she's a social worker. Social worker. Social worker in Southern California. I mean, can you imagine having to, you don't make a lot of money in a world like that, right? So How do you get ahead? She figured she'd be working her entire life and trying to exist in that particular environment. And now she has 10 properties to herself, plus her, her spouse has 10. They're, I mean, it's, it's a completely different life than it was two years ago when I first talked to her. Love it, man. Kudos to you. So what are your favorite states for, for investment, uh, single family uh, investments right now? I love the South and the Midwest, basically. I mean, it's really, there's, there's deals all over there. I love, I love uh, Missouri. Ar Arkansas is actually my favorite state. It just There's not as many deals out there. I love that state because of how the people are. Um, I mean, they, there's laws on the books. If you don't pay your rent, you can be arrested. I mean, that's stealing is what it is out there. That to me is awesome. It's how we need to treat that stuff. Guys, you don't take advantage of somebody else at all. If, right. if you don't want us to take advantage of you and hit you at $400 a month for rent, because that's what the market says, don't take advantage of me and not pay the rent that I'm charging you. Yeah. Amen. What my, my mom, and my mom always says, um, we, we fix everything on the property immediately and we don't beg for rent. You're going to pay on time and we're going to fix and keep your property in good shape. And yeah. that's the terms of the engagement. And if you don't like it, don't sign the lease. And they're like, got it. So she's a, she's a wonderful property manager. She's fantastic and partner. Okay, Aaron, last question for you. Have you heard anything about a massive microchip factory that's going, that was, uh, um, I think in Ohio, that was going in in Ohio. And do you ever... Do you ever focus on an area because you see some prospect of future economic expansion in that area and you just want a piece of that pie? Um, honestly, I, I hadn't heard about that. And it's the people I work with will go out there and ferret those opportunities out and start doing what they're doing and start, I'll start capitalizing on the business side because of my relationship. Not so much am I out there trying to find it and ferret that out. Um, Plus, I have such a vast database of clientele and they go find it and then just sending me requests for loans. So I'm blessed in that respect. I know that that's kind of a crappy response where it should be just I should be actively looking for those things. Time is just a factor that I don't have to be able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I wish I had a, a, had the resources to go out there and be looking for these things and start alerting my clients. It would be awesome if I had that. I'd, but that's a very, very good question. I have a really, really crappy answer for it. <laughs> no worries. Well, at least you're honest as always, brother. Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Um, we're going to put the links that I said into the show notes. Appreciate you sharing so generously with our audience. Um, last thing, if people want to reach out to you, if they want advice on financing investment properties, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Just go to the website, aaronchapman.com. And if that doesn't work, do aaronbchapman.com. That was the one that was first. And some I was able to pick up the Aaron Chapman years later. Um, so either one of those will work and, um, you know, reach out to us, send a message. I have an uh, assistant, Brianna, who monitors my, my inbox all the time and sets me up and she'll schedule time for us to get on the phone. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thanks, Josh. I'm looking forward to it, brother.